Are uh, there joys or concerns that you want to share? Continue to keep uh, Bonnie Daniels in your prayers. We're glad to see Gary again this morning. Amen. Anybody else have any? I do want to say that um, when we have coffee fellowship after church, if you don't like coffee, we also have tea or hot chocolate in the Keurig, then you can sure come and join, join us after church for fellowship. Uh, uh, the, this is the Encore Sunday, uh, United Methodist <coughs> Committee on Relief. And this money goes to fund the program. There is also separate designations for the different disasters. So if you ever want to give to, uh, for instance, uh, Winterset Tornado, you can make that notation on your check and it, just make it to the church, not to Umcor, and then they'll get sent where it belongs. Um, The newsletter, I think, has the information of some of the uh, disaster relief information. Uh, Lenten breakfast this week is here. Your bulletin says to be announced that it's here. Um, then we have go back to the sanctuary next Sunday. We will be. Uh, worshiping in the sanctuary. Uh, then we have um, Monday, Thursday ser services on the 14th. And then Easter is approaching fast. And I think that's all for our announcements. Oh, I'm sorry. Greet one another. I, I knew there was something I wasn't doing. It's not on my... Happy birthday. How are you? Good morning. Good morning.
Our goodness for our response you've called to worship. <clears throat> By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God reported beforehand that we should walk in them. Let us worship God in our unison prayer. God of infinite goodness and mercy, we cannot escape your presence. Your promise remains with us in every situation. When we are desolate, your spirit comes to comfort us. Amid our tribulations, your chosen one remains our firm hope. We can sing your song wherever we are. We shall forever give thanks to the gift of grace. You are God, who never forsakes us. To you be praise and glory. Amen. Amen. pray in Jesus name who taught us to pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and it is not temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Are there any young disciples that want to come up? We'll sing, Fill My Cup, Lord.
and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that land, a whole, in that whole country, and he began to be in need. <clears throat> so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to feel, fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer to be worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the <clears throat> best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, who was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what, him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all of these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. A couple of
the notes about that scripture. <clears throat> In that time, it was uh, an insult to ask for your inheritance. It was like saying, I wish my father was dead so I could have my money. And the other thing, it wasn't the normal thing for a father to go out and approach the son. The son was to, usually came to talk to the father. So both of these were unusual circumstances and was not according to their culture. My message is lost and found. And I want to begin by telling you a parable of the river, which is from Max Lucado's book, In the Grip of Grace. I think you'll recognize it. There were five sons who lived in a mountain castle with their father. The eldest was an obedient son, but his four younger brothers were rebellious. Their father had warned them of the river, but they had not listened. He had begged them to stay away from the bank, lest they be swept downstream. But the river's lure was too strong. Each day, the four rebellious brothers ventured closer and closer, until one son dared to reach in and feel the water. Hold my hand so I won't fall in, he said. And his brothers did. But when he touched the water, the current yanked him and the th other three into the rapids and rolled them down the river. Over the rocks they bounced. Through the channels they roared. Their cries for help was lost in the rage of the river. After hours of struggle, they surrendered to the pull of the river. The waters finally dumped them on the bank of a strange and distant country in a barren place. Savage people dwelt in the land. It was not safe like their home. Cold winds chilled the land. It was not warm like their home. Rugged mountains marked the land. It was not inviting like their home. Though they did not know where they were, of one fact they were sure. They were not intended for this place. For a long time, the four sons lay on the bank, stunned at their fall, and not knowing where to turn. After some time, they gathered their courage and re-entered the waters, hoping to walk upstream. But the stream was too strong. They attempted to walk along the river's edge, but the terrain was too steep. They considered climbing the mountains, but the peaks were too high. Besides, they didn't know the way. Finally, they built a fire and sat down. We shouldn't have disobeyed our father, they admitted. We are a long ways from home. With the passage of time, the sons learned to survive in the strange land. They found nuts for food and killed animals for skins. They determined not to forget their homeland, nor abandon hopes of returning. Each day they set about the tasks of finding food and building shelter. Each evening they built a fire and told stories about their father and older brother. They longed to see them again. Then one night, one brother failed to come to the fire. The others found him the next morning in the valley with the savages. He was building a hut of grass and mud. I've grown tired of our talks, he told them. What good does it do to remember? Besides, this land isn't so bad. I will build a house, a great house, and settle here. But it isn't home, they objected. No, but it is if you don't think of the other one. But what about Father? What of him? He isn't here. I'm making new friends. I'm learning new ways. If he comes, he comes. But I'm not going to hold my breath. And so the other three 
left their hut building brother and walked away. They continued to meet around the fire, speaking of home and dreaming of their return. Some days later, a second brother failed to appear at the campfire. The next morning, the siblings found him on the hillside, staring at the hut of his brother. How disgusting, he said. Our brother is an utter failure. It's an insult to our family name. Can you imagine such a despicable deed? Well, what he's doing is wrong, agreed the youngest. But what we did was wrong as well. We disobeyed. We ignored our father's warning. Well, we may have made some mistakes, but compared to the sleaze in the hut, we're saints. Father will dismiss our sin and punish him. Come to the fire with us. No, I think I'll keep an eye on our brother. Someone needs to keep a record of his wrongs to show father. And so the two youngest brothers returned to the camp, leaving one brother building, the other judging. The two remaining sons stayed near the fire, encouraging one another and speaking of home. Then one morning, the youngest son awoke to find that he was alone. He searched for his brother and found him near the river stacking rocks. It's no use, the rock stacking brother said, explained as he worked. Father won't come for me, I must go to him. I offended him, insulted him, I failed him. There's only one option. I will build a path back up the river and walk into our father's presence. When he sees how hard I've worked and how diligent I have been, he will have no choice but to open the door and let me into the house. The last brother didn't know what to say. He returned to sit by the fire alone. One morning, he heard a familiar voice behind him. Father has sent me to bring you home. The youngest lifted his eyes to see the face of his eldest brother. You have come for us, he shouted. For a long time, the two embraced. And your brothers, the eldest finally asked. One has made a home here, another is watching him, the third is building a path up the river. So the firstborn set out to find his siblings. He went first to the thatched hut in the valley. Go away, stranger, screamed the brother through the window. You're not welcome here. I have come to take you home. You have not. You have come to take my mansion. This is no mansion, firstborn countered. This is a hut. Don't you remember the house of your father? I have no father. Suddenly, the savages in the house filled the window as well. Go away, intruder. This is not your home. You're right. But neither is it his. The eyes of the two brothers met, and the hut-building brother felt a tug at his heart. But the savages had won his trust, so he sent him away. Firstborn sought the next brother. He didn't have far to walk. On the hillside near the hut sat the fault-finding son. When he saw firstborn Firstborn approaching, he shouted, How good that you're here to behold the sin of our brother. Are you aware that he never speaks of home? I knew you would come. I have kept a careful record of his deeds. Punish him. He deserves it. Firstborn spoke softly. We need to deal with your sins first. My sin? <coughs> Yes, you disobeyed father. The son smirked and slapped at the air. My sins are nothing. There's the sinner, he claimed and pointed to the hut. Let me tell you of the savages who stay there. 
I'd rather you tell me about yourself. The fault-finding brother was at the hut before he noticed that firstborn hadn't followed him. Next, the eldest son walked to the river. There he found the last brother, knee-deep in water, stacking rocks. Father has sent me to take you home. The brother never looked up. I can't talk now. I must work. Father knows you have fallen, but he will forgive you. He may, the brother interrupted, struggling to keep his balance against the current, but I have to get to the castle first. I must build a pathway up the river. First, I will show him I'm worthy. Then I will ask him for mercy. He has already given his mercy. I will carry you up the river. Father sent me to carry you home. I am stronger. I am a great sinner. I need much work. No, my brother, you don't need much work. You need much grace. The distance between you and our father's house is too great. You haven't the strength nor the stones to build the road. That is why our father sent me. He wants me to carry you home. I know who you are. You're the voice of evil trying to seduce me, to keep me from my holy work. I will win his favor. I will earn his mercy. Finally, firstborn turned and left. The youngest, the youngest brother was waiting near the fire when firstborn returned. The others didn't come? No. One chose to indulge, the other to judge, and the third to work. None chose our father. So they will remain here for now. And we will return to the father, asked the brother. Yes. <coughs> will he forgive me? Would he have sent me if he wouldn't? And so the younger brother climbed on the back of the firstborn and began the journey home. Did you see yourself in any of these brothers? I recognized similarities of each of the four brothers at different times in my life. Not acknowledging God. Oh, my sins aren't so bad. How could God forgive me? I'm such a sinner. Can we earn salvation? Now I search for a greater understanding of God's love, mercy, and grace. <coughs> Again, quoting Max Lucado, God gets angry because disobedience always results in self-destruction. God has revealed himself to us through his creation. Nature is a song of many parts, but one theme and one verse. God is. What makes us special is not our body, but the signature on our lives. We are his work of art. We are created in his image to do good deeds. We are significant not because of what we do, but because of whose we are. In Romans chapter 2, Paul confronts those who pass judgments on someone else. In other words, anyone who dilutes, dilutes God's mercy with his own prejudice, like the prodigal son's older brother. The key word here is judge. It's one thing to have a conviction. 
It's another to convict the person. It is our job to hate the sin, but it is God's job to deal with the sinner. God justifies the believer, not because of the worthiness of his belief, but because of Christ's worthiness. Romans 3.10 says, There is no one who always does what is right, not even one. Grace is created by God and given to man. No other system, ideology, religion proclaims a free forgiveness and a new life to those who have done nothing to deserve it but deserve judgment instead. Holiness demands that sin be punished. Mercy compels that the sinner be loved. How can God do both? Romans 3, 24, 25 says, All need to be made right with God by his grace, which is a free gift. They need to be made free from sin through Jesus Christ. God gave him as a way to forgive sin through faith in the blood of Jesus. Why don't people accept Christ's free gift? Some are too embarrassed. To accept forgiveness is to admit sin, a step that we are often slow to take. Others fear a trick, a catch. Surely there's some fine point in the Bible. It can't be true. Others think... Who needs forgiveness when you're as good as I am? Through grace, though grace is available to all, it is accepted by a few. Many choose to sit and wait, while only a few choose to stand and trust. Think of it this way. Sin puts you in prison. Sin locked you behind the bars of guilt, shame, and deception, and fear. Sin did nothing but shackle you to the walls of misery. Then Jesus came and paid your bail. He served your time. He satisfied the penalty and set you free. Christ died, and when you cast your lot with him, your old self died too. I continually remind myself that grace is receiving what I do not deserve, and mercy is receiving is not receiving what I do deserve. Praise God. about the prayer. Holy God, without your loving grace, we are nothing. We cling to your saving grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Search our hearts and our minds. Weed out the unkind thoughts. Fill us with gratitude and patience. May the joy in our hearts be reflected in our actions. When our bodies get tired and weary from the stress of life, renew our minds and hearts that we might eagerly serve you by serving our neighbors. Give us the courage to be bold in sharing our faith with others. We give you praise as we see your healing hand among us. So many of your people are struggling with health issues, and every day we hear of more people in accidents and disasters, both here and around the world. We see or hear of the destruction in our country and around the world caused by hate and greed. Help us to remember that you are in control. 
Guide us in the ways in which we can make a difference. May we live faithfully, trustingly, and peacefully. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.